The heroes of ancient literature aren't always demigods or kings. Sometimes they're common people who have common people problems. The oldest narrative poem that comes down to us from the Egyptian civilization is a little newer than the Gilgamesh stories, but not much. It was written in the 19th century BC, and it tells the story of the transition of power between the first pharaoh of the Middle Kingdom and his son, who takes over for him after he dies. But the story isn't told from the perspective of kings, it's told from the perspective of a man who serves the prince and some problems he has when he realizes that his king is dead and that his prince uh, is going to inherit the kingdom. So this is called the tale of Sinuhe, or the story of Sinuhe. And Sinuhe, who is the narrator of the poem, is just a regular guy. Maybe, maybe he's a courtier, maybe he's a guard, maybe he's just a soldier. It's a little bit unclear. But the story begins when Sinuhe is on campaign with the prince of Egypt in Libya, and they're fighting the Libyans. The Libyans were a western foe who bordered Egypt uh, in the Middle Kingdom. And news comes that the king has died and the prince needs to go basically uh, become coronated. And instead of rejoicing that his, that his prince is ascending to the throne, Sunuhe gets scared. And I want to pick up in the story where he realizes that things are not going to go so well for him. Now when I was standing on duty, I heard his voice as he spoke, as I was a little way off. My heart staggered, my arms spread out, my trembling fell on every limb. I removed myself, leaping, to look for a hiding place. I put myself between two bushes until the traveler had parted from the road. I traveled southwards. I did not plan to reach this residence, expecting strife would happen. I did not think to live after him. The hymn mentioned here at the end is his king. He's saying, look, I freaked out. I heard this messenger tell the prince, your father's dead, your king. And instead of going with him, I ran away. And in fact, Sinuhe runs very far away. He says he's not going back to the residence. That would be the palace or you know the seat of power in Egypt. Instead, he travels across northern Egypt all the way up the coast of the eastern Mediterranean into the Syrian lands. Country gave me to country, he writes. I set out for Byblos. I got to Kedem. I spent half a year there when Amenushi carried me off. He was the ruler of Upper Retgenu, and he told me, you'll be happy with me. So he ends up in probably northern Lebanon, southern Syria, those areas, and this king Amunenshi, he captures or maybe, you know, compels in some way uh, Sinuhe to come along with him to his court. And Sinuhe ends up living for a long time with the Syrians. Now, the Syrians are curious, you know, why, why did you run away from Egypt? There, there's some historical evidence that Syria saw Egypt as sort of their big bad foe down in the south. And so this Egyptian who's run away, it's very curious. And so the, the king of Syria asked uh, Sinuhe, why did you run away? And Sinuhe says something interesting. He says, I spoke in half-truths. I have come from the expedition to the Libyan land. It was reported to me, and my heart failed, and carried me off in the ways of flight. I had not been talked of, and my face had not been spat upon. I heard no reproaches. My name had not been heard in the herald's mouth. I do not know what brought me to this country. It is like a plan of God. So he says he's, he's holding a little bit back, but what he says to the king of Syria does accord with what he says earlier, that he's not really sure, but he freaks out, and he's not even sure why. And this idea that, that he's just scared, his human frailty has caused him to run. And he clarifies, this is kind of in defense of himself, he says, look, no one implicated me in the king's death. And this is a little bit weird of a thing for just a random servant of the prince to say, but apparently there's evidence that the first king of the Middle Kingdom uh, was poisoned, and so there may be a little bit of the context here of the readers of it would know, hey, you know, we heard that that king was assassinated, maybe Sanuhe had something to do with it. 
And so he's defending himself in this story, saying, no, like, the Herald wasn't after me, no one suspected me. And then he says something very interesting, which is in line with a lot of uh, Egyptian thought, uh, Sumerian thought, Hebrew thought, this idea that, you know, sometimes if you end up far away from your kingdom, uh, maybe because of your own mistakes, there's providence there. There's some divine guidance going on. Now, Sinuhe does very well for himself uh, in Syria. He, uh, he rises up in the Syrian court. The king of Syria favors him. And an enemy ends up coming against the Syrians. And Sinuhe goes out and basically defeats the enemies of Syria. There's this great scene where he's facing off against this foe. Then his shield, his axe, his arm full of javelins fell to me. After I had escaped his weapons and made them pass by me, with his arrows spent in vain, one after another, he approached me and I shot him. My arrow stuck in his neck. He cried out and fell on his face. I felled him with his own axe and gave my war cry on his back. You know, we, we, have, this, we have this idea maybe uh, in our modern day that very old literature, you know, m- maybe exciting things happen, but it's not, you know, play by play. It's not cinematic. You know, we can't really imagine the, you know, parries and death blows but we very much can here. And we have this kind of epic, almost barbaric scene of cutting this guy down with his own axe and then standing on his dead body and bellowing forth. Um, there's this implication that it's sort of intimidating all the rest who would come against them. It's not unlike um, Enkidu in one of the Gilgamesh stories we looked at last time, where Enkidu goes out and tells the foe of Gilgamesh, that's my king, and he's Gilgamesh, and everyone cowers in fear because of the fearsomeness of the name of Gilgamesh. But the tale of Sinuhe doesn't end just with defeating one's enemies and being done with it. There's this sense of of divine destiny that we mentioned earlier that shows up in the poem that leads Sinuhe home. Uh, Practically, what happens is a letter is sent from the Egyptian court to the Syrian court saying, hey, we're looking for Sinuhe. We hear that he's in Syria. Sinuhe, if you're there, come back to Egypt. Your, your fatherland misses you. Now, Sinuhe does this, but he's terrified because he knows, look, I kind of split on my prince. He has every right to deal very angrily with me. And when Sinuhe gets back to the court, he basically expects, like, this guy might have my head. But instead, the king of Egypt bestows honor and great glory upon Sinuhe. And the the closing lines of the tale of Sinuhe are are very beautiful. I was given the house of a governor, such as belongs to a friend. Many craftsmen were building it, and all its trees were freshly planted. A pyramid of stone was built for me in the midst of the pyramids. My image was overlaid with gold, and its kilt with electrum. It is his majesty that has caused this to be done. There is no other lowly man for whom the like was done. I was in the favors of the king's giving until the day of landing came. So it ends from start to finish, as found in writing. We have this summing up in the last couple lines that Sinuhe has been has come back after many years of exile and real kind of shame. And he is exalted. He's given a pyramid. He's treated greater than any lowly man. Now, it would, be, it would be wrong to think that the ancients didn't value the common man. But I think, you know, as, as I mentioned before, we, we have these odd ideas about uh, cultures very far removed from us. One of the things that we see in the tale of Sinuhe, which was a very popular poem for hundreds of years uh, after its writing, there are many copies that we have uh, stretching from basically across the Middle Kingdom from the 19th century uh, down to the 16th century at least. This shows us that there is a treasuring of the common man, of the lowly man. And Sinuhe pokes at our humanity, saying, look, sometimes we really fail. Sometimes we, we fail the people we want to serve the most. But there is hope that we can be restored. Thanks for hanging out and talking about Egyptian poetry. Next time we're going to look at hymns in the ancient world.